apps. Love them or hate them, they are a huge part of how we interface with the world. Mobile applications are how most people experience most websites. And as such, having good apps is super important. Whether or not you like React Native, it's important to recognize how much value it's brought the mobile development community, both by standardizing a set of tools that any developer can use to build great mobile apps, and also by introducing a lot of important concepts to mobile developers. Even if most mobile devs don't love what React Native is doing, they have to at least contend with the cool stuff happening. And with such, we end up with awesome things like Code Push, Swift UI, and so much more. As of today, React Native is pushing a little bit harder than ever did before. Because starting now, React Native works on servers. No, I'm not talking about server components. At least, I'm not yet. Because first, mobile devs need to get their feet wet in servers. What do I mean? Well, first, I want to talk about the developer spectrum. I've talked about this in other videos before, but there's a spectrum for developers. Technically, you can go further in either direction where you have like infrastructure or hardware engineers on one side, and you have like designers and people in Figma on the other. But I've chosen to, to shorten this to backend and frontend. So now the question is, where do mobile devs go? Historically, I used to think mobile devs fit right here. And I was wrong. I learned that I was wrong when I keynoted Chain React, which is a React Native conference. And I talked about how cool server components would be for mobile devs. Sadly, when I started talking about servers, most mobile devs kind of like broke out into a cold sweat because they hate servers so much that not only do they try to avoid using them, they actually actively adopt alternatives like Firebase. I'd go as far as to say Firebase would not have been a successful platform if it wasn't for mobile devs and their just general disdain towards servers. As such, I've slowly learned that mobile devs, not only are they closer to front end, they're actually past here. And they work even further from the servers than most front end devs do. When I realized this, it hurt me deeply. <laughs> Because products like Upload Thing expect you to have a server. Because if you don't have a server, the only way you can authenticate a user is if someone else's server has the right integration for what you need. And I don't want to have to build Firebase plugins, Subabase plugins, and all these other UI things in our web app so that a user can upload a file safely with something like Upload Thing. Most developers building applications should have a server of some form where they can safely run code that connects to any of many sources, any of many things, so you can render the correct UI for the user safely. Sadly, Sadly, this has been incredibly difficult for mobile, so much so that whole product categories have been formed around helping mobile devs avoid doing this. I'm pretty familiar with this, though, because a lot of front-end tools were in a similar place. You remember the era where everybody was trying to make automatic GraphQL endpoints for their databases? Remember Hasura, my favorite product? Hopefully you can detect the sarcasm there, because I hated all of those tools. I really hated the idea of drawing a hard line between backend and front end and telling people on either side, hey, you don't have to pay attention to what's on that other side. Don't worry, we got you. Just pass some JSON over the fence. We're fine. Mobile devs put this line even further, which is terrifying. Thankfully, in the web, we learned our lesson quickly. And with tools like Next.js, even Gatsby, we realized we could do a little bit of backend to make our front ends better. As of today, a lot of those same things can be done in mobile apps too, specifically React Native apps using the newest version of X Expo. What the hell am I talking about? Why are mobile devs going to be doing backend? Let's take a look. Expo Router v3 is here. Full stack React for iOS, Android, and web. This is the piece we're here to focus on. API routes. And no, this isn't just a thing for web. I know it's easy to assume that, but we're here to talk about API routes. Although I will say it's hard to not talk about the Tailwind support because Expo hired the person who was building Native Wind and they got Tailwind working in Expo directly, which is super, super cool. So if you want to hear me talk about Tailwind on mobile, let me know in the comments. Expo Router v3. API routes, bundle splitting, speed improvements, and more. Welcome to the Expo Router v3, our most powerful release yet. Today, we're introducing beta support for the newest Expo platform, servers. This is such a bold statement. I don't think y'all understand. Telling mobile devs that their tooling is now prepared to handle servers is a huge deal. And yes, this is setting up a future where server components can happen. But I want to be very clear once again, this is not server components. This is API routes, where you can build a server endpoint for your app and for your website. Let's take a look. This syntax might look somewhat familiar. It's similar to the file-based routing you have in something like Next. But instead of a route.ts, it's api.ts, and it's plus api.ts. So you know this is for an API endpoint. And here, you can import expo request response. As far as I know, you can also use browser standards, which is cool. But the important piece here is that in your code co-located with your mobile code, you can do things that are on the back end. So you can safely connect to a database. You can safely handle authentication. You can safely do all sorts of things you might have needed to spin up a back end for before, just writing one file in your code base. Igor already said in chat, TRPC. Yes, this makes supporting TRPC in an Expo app trivial. Super, super cool stuff. I've been waiting for this for a while because having server support in your application is necessary to do a lot of important things. 
And now you can just export a get, export a post, and you're done. Really, really cool stuff. And as they say here, it's the first step towards making Expo Router a full stack React framework. But this is backend code. So where's the backend? Where is this running? How does this even work? No better way to see how this works than to try it, right? First, we need to create an Expo app. I'm using the dash T, which I believe is for the TypeScript template, but it also should include Expo Router. Oh, oh, it's for me to make decisions. Cool. Dope. Expo backend test. Cool. And now we have the main entry point. We have a bunch more Expo packages. Importantly, though, we have the Expo router. The Expo router is an interesting thing because it kind of walks the line between a router and a framework, where Next is a framework that is a router built in. Expo is kind of a router with a framework built in. It does really cool stuff and probably deserves a video of its own. But the focus here is not all the cool stuff you can do with the router. It's specifically the ability to do this API stuff. So let's do it the way I would. We'll make our API folder inside of the app. And here I will make test.ts. The catch here is for the Expo router to know this for an API, you've put plus API at the end. I don't love that syntax. I really like in SvelteKit that you put the plus in the front because it moves all of the things that affect routing to the top just due to alphabetical order sorting in your editor, which is really nice to see, oh, these are the things that are routes. Everything else isn't part of that. I like the syntax a lot. I wish more things stole it because it's really good. But I do also generally like that you can have a custom name that represents things while also specifying that it's an API, that I don't have to do test and then inside of there have an API. So like in next, the way you would do this is you'd have test the folder, and then in here you'd have route.ts, which I would say is the worst of the conventions. This is a, a better hybrid, feels a little remixy. Overall, not bad. But what we wanna do is process a request and return a response. I'm actually just gonna follow along with their docs. So nice and simple. One important piece is we have to specify in the app JSON that there is a server output. So we'll do that by going into the app JSON and under web, we're going to change that to output server. Cool. Now that's been changed. We can host this theoretically anywhere that supports a node server, such as Netlify, Cloudflare, and Vercel. So let's do it. It works in any Winter CG compliant environment, which is really cool if you're not familiar with Winter CG. It's the group of people making a standard for JavaScript runtimes. So you can have code that handles request response and it will work in Cloudflare's Edge, it'll work in Dino, and it'll work in Node. It's a really cool project and a really cool part of like the W3C standards to try and make all of these things standard. Let's go back to actually showing how it works though. So we have our API.ts, just gonna copy paste this code because it's easy. And again, they're using Expo request response, but this should be able to be any web standard. We'll be sure to test that momentarily. But now we have this endpoint and when we get, it'll return with JSON with key hello value world. We can run it with npx expo, cool. Normally you'd open up the web view, iOS simulator, Android simulator, or scan the QR code and run it on your phone so you can actually see things. I demoed that before, it's really cool stuff. We don't care about any of that. We just wanna hit backend. So let's give it a shot. No easier way than curl, right? Localhost 8081 is the port it defaulted to. Interesting, we can go with that. API test. And look at that. We get a response from our server in Expo. So since we put this in API test, the URL will be slash API slash test. And when I curl this, we immediately get the response, hello world, super cool. I wanna delete all the Expo code. Now there is no Expo specific code here. Look at that, it still works. Ready for something really fun? We're gonna make a new project real quick. Bunx, create next app at latest, project name, API demo, enter a bunch, cool. Here is a random Next.js project. You can tell because it has way too much tailwind in the initial example. Let's make an API folder. Let's make a file named test, again, slash route.ts, because Next has different opinions about how these things should be named. But I am pasting that exact code. If we look here, that is the exact same code between the Expo backend and the Next API. And if I uh, bun run dev, so now if I curl, localhost 3000, which is where the next app is. Same exact response. The specific thing I'm trying to showcase here is that this is web standard code. If you learn how to do this in Expo, you know how to do it in Next. You know how to do it in most other things. Really, really nice. You can write this code once, learn these patterns once, and reuse them other places. It also means you can write a bunch of route processors that export the get, the post, and all these things, and it will just work in Expo now, and it will just work in Next too. The reason this is important is so you look at how Upload Thing works. If you're already familiar, Upload Thing is a project that my company, Ping, built in order to make it easier to manage file uploads in your web dev projects. We say next here, well, this Expo change, we're gonna have to change our branding because finally you can include our existing bindings in your Expo app and it should just work. Just to take a look at how you handle Next right now, 
or we can scroll to the upload thing route to yes. You import our create route handler function. You import your file router, which is backend code that defines what users can do. And now you export const get post by calling our function. And we just return a get function and a post function. And as long as these are using web standard request response, which they are, now this binding will work exactly as is in both Next and in React Native. That is so, so cool. And we finally have a happy path to supporting good mobile experiences for our React Native developers that want to use upload thing. I am hyped on this. It is so cool that you can finally, in your Expo apps, have well-integrated backend stuff. Someone in chat just asked a really good question, but where is the server? Very important question. When you use Next, you're probably gonna post on Vercel. There's a lot of other cool places you can upload your Next app to and run it. You can run it in a container. You can run it on Netlify or Cloudflare or these other serverless places. And as you might be sensing, you do the same exact thing here. So let's quickly deploy this deployment. For maybe familiar with the basics of NPX Expo export. So if you just wanna use Express and like run the Expo app within Express, you can do that. You can also, again, use web standards. Let's take a look at the Vercel one. It's experimental and subject to breaking changes. Cool, we're gonna do it. Create a server entry file. All requests will be delegated through this middleware. The exact file location is important. API slash index.js. The reason this has to be here, I'll explain momentarily. I think y'all will understand once I do though. So now we're gonna grab this Vercel JSON. Vercel JSON's a cool way to configure frameworks that don't have a bunch of built-in support like Next. Theoretically, you can use the Vercel JSON to support basically anything. In fact, I started using Vercel as a Vite user because I wanted to host endpoints. A cool thing many people don't know about Vercel is on any project, you can make this API directory and you can just put things in it. Like I could put hello.go and I can write Go code in here. And then when I go to slash API slash hello, once this is deployed, it will run this Go code serverless and send a response. There's a bunch of languages that Vercel supports in the API directory that have nothing to do with Next whatsoever. And I feel like this gets missed a lot because people just think of Vercel as the next thing, but you can support a bunch of different things with it. Here's the doc with all of the official and unofficial runtimes. Here's all the things they officially support. You can run Node, which is the more traditional JS on the server, as well as Edge, which is the Cloudflare JavaScript that tends to run a bit faster because it can skip a lot of the cold start stuff, but also is limited with what it does and doesn't support. So a lot of old packages won't work there. We also have Go, Python, Ruby, and a bunch of community ones like Bash, Dino, PHP, Rust. See some other cool stuff too. I know that, for example, Guillermo actually has done some cool demos with the PHP binding. Very easy way to deploy basically any language serverless without thinking about it. We're not here for any language, we're here for JavaScript. So as I showed you here, we're creating this handler. It binds to the dist server folder, which gets built when we build. And this allows for this index.js endpoint that the Vercel JSON points to. Functions, API index.js. Here's the runtime it uses, here's the files to include. And now that we have that done, I will continue following the instructions to make sure I do it the way they want me to. Now I have to add the Vercel build script, which they showed that as a code snippet, but it's relatively simple to add. Package scripts, Vercel, build. Cool. I already have the Vercel CLI, so Vercel deploy, MPX Vercel deploy. Obviously this was on GitHub, I could have just clicked the button, but this is easier. Uh, my personal, not an existing project, next back and test, code is here. We'll let it do its thing. Theoretically, once this builds, it should all just work. And to those watching the video, who don't think these links will still work, so I'll be sure to take this app down before you try. Here's all the stuff I have in my personal Vercel right now. And we see we have this new Expo backend test. We'll take a look and see how this deployment's going. It's still building. Expect this build to take a decent bit because just like the size of all of the Expo packages is massive. 20 to 30 seconds to get all the packages installed just because it's so much stuff, which I honestly think is fair when again, you consider everything that this build system is doing and that it can then cache the node module so it doesn't have to do this for future builds. Exporting one API route. This is the important bit, the API route, because that's creating that new endpoint for us. Oh, it even created static routes too. Because again, they're trying to make Expo more a full stack framework, even for web. So this also created endpoints and web pages that you can go to, which is pretty cool. Deploying the outputs, about two minutes for the first time building. Not bad at all. Let's take a look. Here is again, the React Native code running here. So you have a whole web app that works, still using Expo. Same code for the web and the mobile app. Really dope. That's what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the curl. So let's curl slash API slash test. Look at that. We have a real endpoint in an Expo app that's deployed on Vercel that returns us some JSON. Was that more steps than I would have liked? 
kind of. But once you understand all of those steps, it makes a ton of sense. Top to bottom, we have the Vercel build, which is a custom build command that Vercel can run to make the web export and deploy that. Vercel looks to this API folder to see if it has things it can use to make new endpoints. So we created an index.js file, so we don't have to build it. By making this .js, we get to skip a bunch of build steps and other things and just write a simple file. This was TypeScript, we'd have to compile it, which would be annoying. We also have the Vercel JSON, which specifies to Vercel, hey, by the way, here's where the output directory is, here are the functions that we defined, and here is what runtime we need for these to run properly. Oh, also, if there are any routes that we don't have a page for, you should redirect them to API slash index.js instead. I think this is totally reasonable. And again, the result is dope. Now in my Expo mobile app, I can export an endpoint and a server that both the web and mobile apps can use. And I can export a web app, like an actual website that people can go to as well. Really, really nice stuff. I am hyped the team has worked as hard as they have to make this all possible. The results, dope. I am genuinely hyped that mobile devs finally can start using servers in their application development. What do you think about all this? Are you excited to start integrating backend more directly with your mobile apps? Do you even build mobile apps? I'd love to hear more about your experiences with APIs, backends, and mobile, and how these things all come together, because we want to get this right. We're working really hard to make upload thing the best possible experience for both mobile and web devs looking to upload files. And what X was built here are the necessary pieces for us to do just that. And again, we haven't even started talking about server components. So I'm really excited for a future where all of these things can come together. Anyways, that's all I have to say about Expo Router v3 and all the cool stuff the Expo team's doing. We'd love your thoughts. Let me know in the comments. See you guys in the next one. Peace nerds.